Heidi, are we ready to get going then? We are. So I think there's just a couple slides you can advance for me or whatever and then hand off to you, so. Um, all right, well, um, welcome uh, to everyone. That's um, some people are still joining on um, to uh, the Coalition of Oklahoma Breastfeeding Advocates uh, June meeting and our webinar um, to follow. Uh, we're gonna have a, hopefully a, a um, not hopefully we will have a very short uh, 30 minute, um, just a business meeting to update uh, those of you. Um, that are joining us today on uh, recent activities within COBA. I'm Becky Mannell and I'm currently the chair of the board of directors. And Heidi, if you wanna advance, um, we're excited to, um, uh, yeah, to uh, yeah, meet with everyone uh, today. And uh, as a reminder, our mission is to promote, protect and support breastfeeding in Oklahoma. And um, yes, we want, all children to have access to human milk. And of course our values are respect and compassion, inclusion and diversity, which we have really been working hard on. Um, as always, evidence-based practices and family empowerment, which we certainly think um, uh, breastfeeding um, goes a long ways towards empowering families. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Heidi, who is our executive director, and she's gonna take it from here. Well, greetings today on June 1st. How did we get to June 1st? Um, we are delighted that you've joined us for our spring meeting. And um, we are also excited about the opportunity to have um, a really great panel discussion this afternoon. COBA cannot do what it does without our wonderful partners. And here are some of our our key stakeholders that we work with um, on a regular basis, the Oklahoma State Department of Health, Maternal Child Health Services, Preparing for a Lifetime, the Oklahoma Mother's Milk Bank, Oklahoma Breastfeeding Resource Center, the Oklahoma Perinatal Quality Improvement Collaborative, and then the United States Breastfeeding Committee. We also have wonderful financial supporters um, that provide the much needed funds to do these type of panel discussions and meetings. Um, special thanks to the Masonic Charity Foundation of Oklahoma, the Robert Glenn Rapp Foundation, the W.J. Jones Family Foundation, the Presbyterian Health Foundation, NBC Bank, Bank First, Insurance Services, Quell Creek Bank, Innovations Lactation and Breastfeeding Services, Your Feeding Friend, Lactation Services, and AMSHOT. And then also, I want to just real quickly, before we continue, remind everyone if um, you can mute um, today, that would be wonderful. That way we don't get any kind of feedback. Um, I would like to introduce two of COBA's new board members. We're absolutely delighted to welcome from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, one of our members at large, Deandra Opoku. Um, Deandra is with the YWCA of Tulsa. And then here in Oklahoma City joining us um, is attorney Jerry Ann Thomas. Continuing this year as our vice chair is um, Julia Prophet, also known as JP. She is in Cushing, Oklahoma. We have Cheryl Coleman, who is our secretary from Verdigree. Our treasurer, Alexis Borcia, and she is from Mustang, Oklahoma. Another one of our board members from Oklahoma City is Lily Beth Sanger Brinkman. And then Erin Kopenbarger is in Oklahoma City. And then we also have Rose Hurd from Tulsa, Oklahoma and Kelsey Watkins, also from the Tulsa area in Bixby. We're also delighted that um, several members of the statewide community have volunteered their time in an advisory capacity. Maggie Green in Oklahoma City, Dr. Monica Henning in Tulsa, Donna Lawrence in Oklahoma City, 
Amanda Swain in Oklahoma City, April Stewart in Oklahoma City, and Dr. Melinda Webb in Stillwater. You feel ugly. Special thanks to those folks who volunteer their time to chair our committees. Erin Kopenbarger is the chair of our Promote Standing Committee. Alexis is the chair of community and engagement and Jerry Ann Thomas works with development. Kelsey chairs our protect standing committee and our workplace is chaired by Nancy Bacon. We will soon have a new chair for public policy. And then Cheryl Coleman is the chair of our support standing committee Brittany Sandoval chairs our Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, and Megan Holzhausen, Maternity Care Practices. Okay, Becky Mannell, our chair, our board chair, will now give us an update on the infant formula shortage. Oh my goodness, um, <laughs> uh, as if we, yeah, didn't have enough to, um, uh, yeah, keep us busy and active and concerned. Um, who would have ever thought that we would be in a situation where we don't have enough formula to feed American babies? Um, so uh, just briefly on this, because um, y'all can certainly go to uh, our website as well and um, click on links and things, but we just want to make sure people kind of had resources out there. There are some good statements with a lot of other resources um, to uh, you know, find information, but the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine and um, of course, ILCA, the International Lactation, uh, Lactation Consultant Association, and then the US Breastfeeding Committee all have um, uh, links and so forth. Of course, those are kind of more on the national, um, even international level, uh, but look more um, locally, of course, you can go on COBA's website, um, OBRC, the Milk Bank, and um, our Oklahoma chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and find you know, information and resources for families here in Oklahoma. Uh, briefly, um, we have fielded tons of media requests. I have another one later this afternoon. Um, so we've had nearby states, some of them, a lot have come through the milk bank. What's the milk bank doing? And my message to everyone here is um, we um, certainly want to make sure that every baby out there, if it's 10 o'clock at night, the parents have something to feed their baby that is safe. And um, so while the milk bank doesn't provide formula, we do um, have an emergency kind of bridge program that we're working with families on an individual basis, especially if they had a baby that was on maybe, um, you know, some type of um, elemental formula due to, you know, severe formula intolerance. Um, we will absolutely work with those families um, to provide, you know, some formula, maybe as they bridge the gap and are transitioning to another formula that they're not sure their baby will tolerate. So maybe having some donor milk to kind of, um, you know, bridge a little bit of, or help with that transition. Um, WIC um, has a lot of good information as well in both English and Spanish. And then I think making sure the message for families out there too is, you know, if they think, if they think their baby can't try a different brand of formula um, to reassure them that yes, they can, all of the formulas on the shelves in the United States are safe and quality formulas. If it's a store brand, a generic brand, those are still good quality formulas and safe to feed their baby. So that's, you know, one message absolutely um, to get out there. And then if it's families that have been, um, you know, um, that are doing some breastfeeding and some formula feeding, certainly call the breastfeeding hotline, check in with local um, lactation consultants or other breastfeeding, you know, support to see what if they might be able to, you know, kind of work to rebuild their milk supply and maybe reduce um, some of the need for formula. But, um, but at the end of the day, we want to make sure that every baby is getting fed and um, that they have the parents aren't panicking, you know, in the middle of the night, um, or driving all day long to find something which uh, I know many are doing. So, um, uh, so yeah, so that's kind of, yeah, quick update on that. We'll certainly be happy to take questions towards the end as we have time. Um, so Heidi, you want to, yeah, maybe move on. And I think is this next one um, for Cheryl to uh, let Cheryl take that one and run yes. with it. Yeah, I got it. 
All right, so the um, Attorney Practices Committee is very excited that we're nearing completion on an update for the COBA model infant feeding policy. Uh, the initial policy uh, was developed in 2009 with a revision in 2015 to reflect current research and recommendations. Um, of course, since that time, there's been additional research on the importance of breastfeeding support in the birthplace, as well as an update to the 10 steps of successful breastfeeding. So we have worked very hard over almost the last year-ish, nine months a year, to uh, develop a new model hospital infant feeding policy based on the revised 10 steps, as well as the additional research that has occurred since 2015. Um, we've designed a document that uh, we feel will support a birthing facility at any point uh, in their journey to increase support for breastfeeding families in their facility. So I wanna thank Megan Holzhausen, Rose Hurd, Kate Kopass, and Victoria Godwin for all of their work in our design and changes and, and what we've got into this document. Um, it will be available soon, probably hopefully within the next month or so. And uh, we'll announce the launch of the uh, update through the COBA monthly newsletter as well. So you'll be able to access it both through the website as we uh, transition to the new one and through the, through the newsletter. So very excited to, to move forward with this. Thank you, Cheryl. I'll just add in that I know um, uh, Cheryl was being quite humble. She did a lot of work on that as well. That committee has worked very hard and we'll be very excited to uh, see that um, updated, revised, um, completely reformatted um, policy when it gets released. So hopefully it will be put to good use. Yes, thank you so much, Maternity Care Practices Committee. Um, I do want to remind you all that we are recording um, today's meeting. Um, so advocacy update. Um, COBA has been just incredibly fortunate to have wonderful um, advocacy partners here at the state level and um, legislators that, that share our mission um, that every baby um, in Oklahoma can have access to human milk. We are super excited um, to announce that donor human milk, pasteurized donor human milk um, in the home setting has been placed in the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority's budget um, for reimbursement by Medicaid. Um, this was um, actually not through legislation, but started through legislation. Um, we started with Senator Kerry Hicks um, and Representative Carol Bush here in Oklahoma last year, over a year ago. Um, it's been about a year and a half with Senate Bill 469 that would provide Medicaid coverage for medically necessary pasteurized donor hum human milk in a home care setting. It went all the way through the Senate and then carry over from last year and all the way through the House. Um, we were assured that it would be added to the House agenda. Um, and then the last day came and went. Um, so there is a, a bit of a, a bittersweet ending, but a silver lining that in the end, um, babies who go home to a home care setting will have access to human milk through Medicaid. Um, also, we have continued to work with the Oklahoma Department of Corrections, um, working out logistics and helping them create a policy um, based on um, what they have in Nebraska. And then also um, at the um, Alabama Prison Birth Project at Tutwiler in Alabama, um, they have been fantastic to help us work with the Oklahoma State Department of Corrections to create a um, policy so that we can create a um, mother's uh, milk collaborative um, there at um, our state prison, Mabel Bassett. Um, now that um, our legislative session in Oklahoma is over, that will ramp back up, but we're really excited to collaborate with DOC and then the Oklahoma Mother's Milk Bank that will help us get the milk from incarcerated persons after they pump it to their infants in the community. 
And then, of course, if you um, are on the United States Breastfeeding Committee's email list, um, you know that right now is a very, very critical time for the PUMP Act here in um, our country, providing urgent maternal protections for Nursing Mothers Act. It passed the U.S. House last year. It's been in the U.S. Senate for nearly a year, and there is um, only really a few more weeks before the Congress um, will hear it. And um, so if, if you um, can, can jot this down, um, you need to text PUMP, P-U-M-P, to 747-464. The USBC has partnered with Moms Rising. It's um, a basically a, a two-minute telephone call campaign and tool. It'll walk you through the process. You'll be prompted to enter your zip code and then you'll be connected to the office of your United States Senator. So we really need to make sure um, that um, the PUMP Act gets to the president's desk. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in our panel discussion. Heidi, I would just add to that for anybody that does follow through um, and you'll have an opportunity to like kind of copy and paste some uh, uh, language and support of the PUMP Act. But one point um, I think um, that would be very prudent to make right now is um, in the midst of a formula shortage, we should be doing everything we can to support currently breastfeeding families to continue breastfeeding and the PUMP Act will do that. Fantastic. And then also um, a bill that was introduced this session in Oklahoma through Kerry Hicks, um, Senator Kerry Hicks, was Senate Bill 611. Although it was not heard in committee, um, we have started the conversation with the Oklahoma Health Care Authority. It's on their radar. It would provide an additional reimbursement for hospitals that have achieved the very um, stringent baby-friendly designation. This year, we added two, um, Dun not, not Duncan, I'm sorry. Um, yes, Duncan Regional and um, SSM Healthcare in um, Shawnee. Um, they not only achieved their status, but they did it during the pandemic. So hats off to them. So again, we're, we've had the conversation. We were continuing to have the conversation with the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority. And then again, trying to think creatively to find additional funding to give these hospitals an incentive um, to become baby friendly. We also had Cherokee Nation and Tahlequah that achieved redesignation, so. Fantastic. Okay, Becky. Uh, so, um, yeah, we uh, um, our uh, COBA board and um, committee leadership um, recently met in Tulsa on one of those downpour days. <laughs> Monsoons. <laughs> Monsoon days. Oh my gosh. Um, and uh, Heidi had um, arranged for a um, yeah professional uh, facilitator, Dan Billingsley, who did an excellent job and really kind of it's really fun, you know, when you bring um, someone in who already has a good understanding of maternal child health issues just by nature of some of the things that he's been interested in and the work that in the other organizations he's worked with. So he already knew a fair amount about breastfeeding and of course had done his homework on COBA. Uh, so, um, but we, uh, uh, we wanted to update our strategic plan that we had most recently come up with in 2019. And of course, one of the big goals from that one was to hire an executive director, which we did, uh, Heidi. Um, so who, uh, yeah, took on, uh, yeah, a completely new endeavor, such as leading our coalition in the middle of a pandemic as well. So, uh, so we've certainly worked on building our infrastructure and getting our name out there a little bit more as well. But um, Cheryl um, helped us do a member survey uh, or just, yeah, survey of all of those who, you know, really, you know, pay, either read our newsletters, express interest in COBA. And um, a couple of things that we found out from that is that, you know, most of you, almost half of you, uh, said that you learned about COBA through a coworker or colleague. So we're just trying to find out, you know, how do we get the word out about COBA? 
and get the message out there. And that, um, you know, majority of you felt that COBA's primary function is to advocate. Um, hence, that's in our title as well. But we've certainly been um, working really hard, um, especially once we got Heidi on board, um, who's been the ringleader in, um, you know, really advocating and, um, and then recruiting funding for scholarships and, and programs like that. So, um, and then um, we also found, yeah, that um, things that y'all want to see addressed, one that we're talking about today, of course, is workplace support. I think that's always on the list. Um, uh, and now more interest in maternal health um, issues and of course, advocacy and legislation. So um, we will be finalizing that strategic plan here um, in the next, our next meeting or so. So later this summer, um, you'll see, you know, some updated um, goals coming out. Okay, so I'm happy to be sharing with you about our IBCLC scholarship program. Uh, we cover the costs, the costs of um, the exam fees, so $660 um, for first-time candidates and $470 for lactation consultants that are recertifying. Uh, you can see down below our deadlines for the exam fee are January 30th for the spring exam and May 31st for the fall exam. Uh, our education scholarship covers $840 uh, needed to be eligible to sit for the exam or $230 for um, continuing education for IPCLCs. Those deadlines are March 31st and September 30th. Next slide. Um, so the reason we implemented this scholarship program was really to expand access to lactation consultants in Oklahoma and to improve not equal but equitable care in lactation. Um, also to improve the ability of IBCLCs to get the continuing education and training required in the field of lactation. As we know, we're always doing more research and learning more about human milk and lactation. Um, and then our priority for those scholarships um, go to those of and serving minority groups or those in underserved or rural areas of Oklahoma. Um, so quickly about this, um, applicants are welcome to apply for both education and the exam fee scholarships. You don't have to choose either or. The exam fee scholarships are dispersed after registration for the exam. Um, and you can apply at any point in your IBCLC journey, whether you're just starting or you're already practicing. Um, and I'm proud to say that we've already awarded eight scholarships. So. It's a really great program that we've started and we're, we're happy to continue it. And we've had our, our first uh, scholarship recipient um, whose exam results are pending, right? So, well, yes, yeah. now we had two. So Keisha Sanders and Carrie Nelson, I believe are both on the call today. And yes, um, they both took the exam in April um, and we'll find out in June. So excited. Okay, um, so at this time, um, if, you, if you do have any questions, you can put them in the chat room or feel free to unmute yourself um, if you would like to um, add anything to today's discussion. Um, we know that we have folks from other states on um, the call today. And so we're really excited to have any input for, from, from you all. Um, again, you know, we, we could not do what we do without our, our wonderful volunteers, our board members, our advisory council, um, our funders, and then our legislative um, partners. And then of course, our partners um, at the state of Oklahoma. Heidi, I will say, um, yeah, while we're waiting, if anyone yeah, has questions, they can unmute or put in the chat box. But uh, just to, uh, one more um, detail on the um, uh, Medicaid coverage for donor milk for babies in the home setting, um, the healthcare authority will be working out there, you know, kind of behind the scenes regulations and so forth on that. Um, and that is slated to take effect November 1st of this year. So we're very, very excited about that. 
So we have um, a, a question from Brenda Bandy. Thank you so much, Brenda, for joining us today, who's the co-executive director of the Kansas Breastfeeding Coalition. Um, she had a question, how did you find your legislative champions? So I have to give a big shout out to um, Joe Dorman. Joe Dorman is the executive director of the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy. Um, Joe um, has been a wonderful champion for COBA's mission. And um, when I came on board, one of the first folks that I visited with was Joe and he opened his arms in his, um, his uh, black book and all of his um, contacts. And one of the first persons that he um, uh, helped us um, uh, hook up with was Senator Kerry Hicks. And um, anyone on this call knows that Senator Kerry Hicks um, knows everyone. She has a fantastic reputation among her Democrat caucus and she works through party lines um, and has just a wonderful respect among um, colleagues um, who are of the Republican party. Um, and Carrie just really um, just shared our mission with so many people like Nicole Miller, um, Joanna Dossett, um, Tony Hasenbeck and um, Carol Bush, Brenda Stanley. And so um, I think that we've made a concerted effort, Brenda, to really spend time at the Capitol and share our mission. And then um, the March of Dimes also, I wanna give a great shout out to um, Lori Applecamp and Aaron Kopenbarger. Um, and then also we've had some wonderful folks who have championed for us from the lobbying sector pro bono. And that is um, uh, Jim Milner and um, also Bud Ground. Um, so we've just really been fortunate and um, we kind of, um, sometimes we didn't know what we didn't know, but I think that we always kept scratching. Um, I would also add that um, some of those contacts came about because of um, uh, relationships that Heidi has built over the years. Um, so getting some pro bono um, lobbying um, and, and at least behind the scenes and, and guidance as you know, as far as how to proceed with certain legislation. But um, I think also an answer to your question, Brenda, too, another another bit of research um, your coalition could do is just, you know, looking at, um, you know, who seems to be either sponsoring bills, authoring bills related to healthcare, maternal child health, um, and, uh, you know, do some outreach, you know, with those individuals and make sure they know about, you know, the, the Kansas Breastfeeding Coalition and what are some issues um, that they might be interested in, in partnering with you on. Absolutely, we had wonderful partners um, last legislative session. Um, the Oklahoma Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers when we passed Senate Bill 121, which allows teachers and all school employees to um, have paid protected um, breaks to pump here in Oklahoma. And we did that last year in 2021, which was huge. And really, um, I have to give a big shout out to several of um, our legislators from the 19 and 2019 and 2020 session um, when the legislature passed um, the paid protected breaks and lactation room accommodations at the Oklahoma State Capitol or any building that is owned and leased or leased by the state of Oklahoma. So that kind of just really served as a model um, for SB 121 when we worked with the OEA and the AFT here in Oklahoma. All right, I think it's 12 noon, Becky. Yes, yes. Again, please contact COBA or the Oklahoma Mother's Milk Bank, the Oklahoma Breastfeeding Resource Center with any questions about formula. You can also call us at 297-5683, which is area code, code 405. Um, we are so grateful to our partners. We have scholarship funds available. Please contact us at info at okbreastfeeding.org. And then of course, we need your help. So again, give us a shout out um, or email us or go to our website because we could definitely use um, more volunteers.
And we are now going to just take a, about a 30 second break so I can switch my screens. Um, and then we will start our navigating lactation support in the workplace panel discussion. Okay, I think we're ready for today's panel discussion. Navigating lactation support in the workplace. I would like to introduce today's chair of our board of directors, Becky Mannell. I like that, today's chair. Today's so, chair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she has been the chair for a long time. <laughs> keep saying this is not a lifetime appointment. So if, if today is, then yeah, I, I might take that and run with it. Uh, but anyway, but um, we're excited to uh, welcome everybody here and particularly um, uh, very happy to, um, yeah, host this panel session and to our panelists who have graciously agreed to, um, uh, yeah, put themselves out there today. So uh, we're very excited about that. And as Heidi said, I'm chair of the board of directors and we introduced our board members um, during our business meeting. Um, but just to remind everyone um, that, you know, coalition, uh, COBA is um, Oklahoma's breastfeeding coalition. We are a member of the US breastfeeding committee and partner with several other entities um, around the state. And we have um, visitors from other state coalitions today. And um, our mission is to um, promote, protect, and support breastfeeding in the state of Oklahoma. So our topic today, of course, is um, uh, yeah, navigating um, workplace support, uh, which is always an issue. And as I made the point earlier when we were talking about the formula shortage and the federal legislation um, that's um, sitting in the Senate, the U.S. Senate right now, um, it now is certainly the time to really make the point that um, if we, um, in the midst of a formula shortage, you know, we absolutely want to do what we can to um, support families that are currently breastfeeding and do what we can to ensure that they can continue uh, breastfeeding and reduce um, some of our reliance on uh, formula. So, um, so Heidi, if you want to advance that on, I think you're ready to, um, yeah, turn it over to Heidi, who's our executive director. Well, I am absolutely thrilled um, to have our three panelists and our moderator today. Um, I have to say that I'm kind of a bit of an online stalker a little bit, although I don't have any social media except for LinkedIn. But I connected with April Kelso um, on LinkedIn, and I think it was an article that she wrote for Above the Law. Um, talking about um, really workplace support, transitioning back to work um, after having children. And it really focused on maternal oh, health. Oh, yeah. Good luck. Uh, maternal health. It should be a drive through that you can take that too. Just a reminder to everybody to please mute yourselves because um, we can hear um, background conversations. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so I was really um, so empowered because April shared um, in her article um, about her transition back to work and um, you know how important it is um, to really focus on maternal health and maternal, you know, our moods um, after we have a baby. And so I connected with April through LinkedIn. And then I started seeing on her LinkedIn, this incredible woman named Michelle Coughlin Browning from Louisville, Kentucky. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to meet this woman. I need to know this woman. So I sent her a LinkedIn request. Um, and then um, Patricia McMahon, I heard um, through a workplace support um, EEOC panel discussion. And I was like, she's amazing. She's from Denver. And then John Kerry out of Durant. Um, I have heard of John Kerry for years. He is um, really a legend in the breastfeeding world here in Oklahoma. Um, and it just so happens that we connected and happened to know so many of the same people. So I just can't tell you how thrilled I am that all four of you are sharing your time today with us to talk about something that's so important, workplace support um, for, for breastfeeding families. So it's my pleasure to introduce your moderator today, April Kelso, who holds a bachelor's degree in political science with an emphasis in public law. She is a graduate from the University of Tulsa College of Law. And following I'm gonna off, advance the slide so you oh, have her. There you go. Um, and April, um, after graduating from law school, she um, worked for over a decade um, doing civil litigation practice work in the Oklahoma City metro area. And then last fall, she left private practice and she now is a senior policy and legal affairs analyst with the state of Oklahoma. April is also the current chair of the Oklahoma Bar Association's Women in Law section. And she has previously contributed to Above the Law through its partnership with Mothers Esquire. Thank you so much, April. Thank you, Heidi. It's hard to follow your enthusiasm. That's so great as I sit in this like windowless conference room in my office. But um, thank you all for having me um, as a former breastfeeding mom myself. This is something that I'm super passionate about and I really appreciate the work that you all are doing in Oklahoma. So I have the privilege of introducing our panelists. We've got three today, as Heidi mentioned. First, uh, John Kerry. He has been uh, with First United Bank and Trust for 30 years as an investment advisor. He served in the Oklahoma House of Representatives from 2002 through 2010. And during his time in the Oklahoma House, he authored House Bill 2102 to provide for breastfeeding anytime, anywhere, and as well as a jury exemption. Mr. Carey graduated from Southeastern Oklahoma State University in 1992 and is the current chairman of the Southeastern Oklahoma State University Foundation Board of Trustees. John and his wife Pam have three children, Guy, Anna, and Emma. We are super excited to have him on the panel. Our next panelist that Heidi mentioned was Patricia McMahon. She is the Outreach and Education Program Coordinator for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in Denver. She serves in multiple roles at the EEOC, including um, the Public Affairs Officer as a trainer with the EEOC National Training Institute with special certification to provide training for EEOC's Respect in the Workplace Program. And she's the Congressional Liaison, as well as the Region 7 Lead for the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, and she's also the Language Assistance Officer under the Language Process Plan. So she's doing a ton of great work at the EEOC. Um, she started her career there after graduating with honors from the Metropolitan State University in Denver. And in her spare time, she enjoys writing and actually authored two books. One is a detective fiction and the other a humor fiction. So um, lastly, we have uh, Michelle Conklin Browning, which is a friend of mine that uh, Heidi mentioned. She's the founder and president of Mothers Esquire, a national nonprofit organization with more than 7,000 members online and advocates for gender equity, motherhood, and caregiver issues. Uh, Michelle is also of counsel at Indy Galley Law in Louisville, Kentucky, and has experience in a variety of practice areas, including trademark, copyright, healthcare services, technology, food products, fashion retailing, insurance, 
as well as being from Kentucky bourbon and horse racing. So um, in addition to practicing law, Michelle is devoted to issues of gender equality and has received numerous awards for her work. Michelle was appointed to the American Bar Association's Presidential Commission on Women, is an adjunct professor of gender law and policy, and is a children's book author. So um, really thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. We're excited to see what you have to say. Um, I'd like to open it up and give each of you an opportunity to give some opening remarks. Um, Patricia, do you want to kick us off? Um. Thank you very much. Uh, gosh, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to I'd like to thank thank you for uh, for allowing me the, the, the opportunity to be here. Um, I just like to start with just saying uh, the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. For those of you who are not familiar with it, is uh, the 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 the, the vision uh, in the federal government which protects all uh, people uh, from uh, discrimination based on your race, sex, national origin, religion, disability, and age. And uh, you you come there if you believe that your rights have been violated under under the law. You have 300 days to file a charge of discrimination um, based on that. And uh, and we are a neutral law enforcement agency. And so our role is not to advocate, but it is uh, to determine whether or not a violation of law has occurred. And uh, and and so uh, I just want to know that in in that role is that that's what I will be speaking on. And so uh, hopefully um, you will take away what, what the federal government um, will, will role will be doing in this. And uh, so that is different than, than the advocate's role. That's great. Thank you for that, Patricia. Uh, Michelle, would you like to share with us a few opening remarks? Sure, thank you, April, and I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> April and I have known each other for quite some time now, and in fact, um, we really bonded over this particular issue as April um, was trying to get some accommodations in place um, uh, at a conference. And so I'm so thankful to get to talk with her today and thankful for her contributions to our About the Law with Mothers Esquire. Um, as April mentioned, I am the founder of a group called Mothers Esquire. It started out as a little tiny little Facebook group, um, mostly because I was a mom and a new lawyer and was really sort of struggling to manage. I was past breastfeeding at the point that I started the group, but I did breastfeed both my girls for a year each, um, including navigating through a summer associate um, um, in all of the events that go with the summer associate um, role. And so, I mean, as well as going to law school and pumping, I, as I always tell people on the 1970s plastic couch in the basement of the law library, um, in a basement bathroom of the law library, because that was the only place that I could go at that time to pump while I was in law school, also pumping on the great lawn before an exam. So these issues are very near and dear to my heart. Um, as part of the work with Mothers Esquire, specifically around breastfeeding, one of the things, I guess I'll focus on two things very briefly, and one of those is that lawyers, like so many professions, have places that they go to work that is their workplace, but they have to also work in so many places that do not have employment obligations to them, working in a courthouse, or if you're a law student going to law school or taking one of my big issues that I'm working on so much right now is the bar exam. Um, and so it's, it's helping to create support for women to know what to ask for, how to ask for it, um, it within their workplace, but also working on how to make sure that the systems are in place, both within the workplace and in places where women, in my case, lawyers need to work that aren't covered under traditional employment relationships. So ensuring that there are pumping spaces and courthouses and those sorts of things. Um, so though that's an issue and that the bar exam is one issue that has really risen to the top lately because that's a multi-day exam. It is your entry into the profession and they be, the, the sort of stance is it's not a disability under the ADA and therefore well, we might provide you a clean space and that's as far as we're going to go. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, but I, um, I will hopefully we'll come back to the resolution that we got passed to the ABA to sort of try to address that um, uh, a little bit later on. But thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you, Michelle. Um, John, do you have any opening remarks to make before we dig into questions? Yeah, so basically just to echo everyone's comments, just, uh, you know, humbled to be here and and uh, to address this issue that that seemed to me uh, to be a no-brainer, but um, really didn't realize 
how many hurdles and struggles there were uh, in front of breastfeeding uh, women. And so uh, obviously having three children and a wife that, that breastfed, was fortunate enough to breastfeed all three of our children. Um, I know how much time and effort and struggle she went through. And so uh, just very humble to be a part of the issue. Thank you for that, John. Um, I'm gonna start with you with our first question, if that's okay. So most healthcare professionals recommend exclusive breastfeeding for six months or longer. With all the data that demonstrates the significant health benefits that breastfeeding provides for both mothers and babies, why do you believe there are so many barriers? You mentioned it in your opening remarks. Why do you think there are so many barriers to breastfeeding in the workplace? I would think that the barriers stem from lack of education. It's been my experience, no matter what the issue is, unless someone's educated on the issue, they seem to be standoffish or uh, unapproach it. Um, I, I would say that in short, it would be just the fact that people don't have all the educational facts that they need to make a, a determinable decision. Great, Michelle uh, or Patricia, do you all have anything to add to that? Um, well, actually I do, because uh, I, I think, think for us we have to understand how the law uh, evolved regarding discrimination and breast, breastfeeding and how it uh, against the, the female employee. Can, can, can I actually come at it from just a, a little bit of a, a legal point? Uh, so except in rare cases bio, biologically, it, it's the female who lactates. So, so henceforth, the, the nexus between lactating uh, or breastfe the breastfeeding that the, the employee in Title VII um, Okay, so in most cases, and this, 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 this kind of, this is where I have to really, really put on my, my, my legal hat, not my advocacy hat. Um, in most cases, lactation, uh, the postpartisan production of milk, is, is physiological. It's a physiological process triggered by hormones, and because lactation is a pregnancy-related medical condition. Uh, less favorable treatment of the lactating employee may raise an inference of un unlawful discrimination. And I'm going to come to you just strictly in, a, in an employment state, but, but this, this actually is something that, that would actually apply in most areas uh, when it comes to in any part. Um, so uh, in, in what we look at it is that um, a manager's statement that an employee was demoted because of, like, say, a breastfeeding schedule, that would raise an inference that the demotion was unlawfully based on their pregnancy-related medical condition of lactation. So, so we look at it like to continue the producing of an adequate milk supply to avoid the painful complications associated with delays in expressing milk. A, a nursing mother will typically need to, to, to breastfeed or express milk using a pump two or three times a day for the duration of an eight-hour work uh, day. So, so the employee must have the same uh, freedom to address this lactation needs as she would like her coworkers who would have to address similar lim limitations of medical examples, uh, medical, uh, medical, <laughs> anyways. So I'm, I'm trying to like kind of get over, over here to, 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 to the, the difference. So, so for example, um, what, we, what we ask is that, is that we look at lactation uh, as a whole of, 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 of something that is biologically attached uh, with, with pregnancy and giving birth. And so when we, when we look at that, we, 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 have to, we have to look at look at the whole of it. It's not just one thing. There, there, there's a whole process attached to it, which, which requires a, a whole of a solution. D does that make sense? Okay, so so that's that that's actually where, where we come from because if you just look at it in, in an individualized situation, you, you can't you can't get 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 to the whole of whole of the solution. Stop there for. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Michelle. Did you have anything to add? Yes, I, I would have to add something too. Kind of going back to what um, John had said earlier, I do think some of this has to do with a lack of understanding. And so I think that there is a component of this where if we can provide an understanding of what breastfeeding 
requires and an explanation. So often when we're writing to a bar examiner's office or if we're writing to an employer or talking about this with a courthouse, say things like, if you don't allow somebody to pump according to the schedule that they need, they, you know, they can, that can result in a, a, a loss of their milk production. It can result in mastitis and try to help them understand that this requires, you know, two to three hours or, you know, every pumping every two to three hours, depending on the age of the baby and then the particular mom I should say lactating individual child dynamic, because of course we want to be inclusive of anybody who is lactating. Um, and so, um, um, but I, I also want to talk about this from, from a slightly more gendered perspective for just a moment, because I think some of it is lack of understanding. I think some of this ties very strongly into um, motherhood penalty. And if you've not studied motherhood penalty, I really encourage you to research that a bit because this is the moment where if for women who are lactating or people who present as women are lactating, um, that that moment is the moment where they really become mothers. And then the, the biases that we have around what mothers should be doing with their time, should in quotes, of course, what they should be doing with their time that really comes to bear, right? And especially when there's such an in your face piece of what they're doing that reminds you over and over again throughout the day that that is a mother. And we have such a bias against mothers in the workplace, very historical. There is an excellent book called uh, by Amy Westervelt called, um, um, of course, the title is going to totally escape me at this moment, but um, um, it's forget having it all, how something about how America has um, failed mothers or, or something along those lines, but it's by Amy Westervelt. It really goes to the historical background around motherhood penalty. And I think that this really like locks into or keys into people's biases about mothers and the, and the workforce. And then the flip of that, and then I'll, I'll stop talking, but the flip of that too, is that I think this is so critical. I feel like there's very deep and systemic and challenging issues around motherhood and kind of to echo what John said earlier too, this seems like it should be so simple. It should be so simple. Why is this so hard? Um, and it's why I focus on it because it feels fixable. Um, and yet it's proving to be harder than it should be. But I think it's so critical to address this because, it, and I don't mean to be hyperbolic, but I feel that this is a moment where you are saying to a mom, you can either have your career or you can feed your child, but you don't get to do both. And that's the message we are saying when we do not provide appropriate accommodations to mom because you're really put in, in even whatever decision comes out of that. Because I know a lot of lawyers will say, I either scaled back my career or I decided not to breastfeed because of how many challenges were put into my way. That doesn't go away after that time period that resentment and frustration over being forced to make that decision between these two critical parts of who you are as a person doesn't go away. So even if you continue on with your career, I mean, 10, 15 years later, you might still decide I'm not going to do this anymore because I'm still so mad over what happened in the way that I was forced to make a decision about my parenthood, my motherhood, um, because of this career. So I, I just, I think the motherhood penalty is something that is so tied into this. So I'll stop there. I, can, I, can I just piggyback on something that, that you said? Because it actually ties into, I was gonna address this later, but I'll, I'll address this now because it actually ties into equity. Um, and it's something that is, that is very much at the heart of, of our agency because this is actually where equity starts. And when you really get into, um, uh, you know, health equity, employment equity, things like that. Um, this is this is this is where you have to make make just un, unfathomable choices with um, you know mothers. And and when you talked about um, uh, you know the 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 you know the, the mother penalty, men don't have this penalty, do they? Right? I mean, they don't have to make the decision on whether or not they're they are going to provide these nutrients to their child. I mean, they they don't have to make this heartbreaking choice. And and these and this is this is actually where equity starts because we do know that um, minority females um, have a, a, at a certain point breastfeed their children less. Well, that is actually because they are in positions 
where mother rooms, you know, nursing rooms and things like that are less available to them. So they actually have to make the choice not to breastfeed. And we do know that children who are breastfed are actually healthier than children who are not breastfed. So we actually start um, putting in um, a, a penalty not just to the mothers, but to their children later down the road. And this is where equity starts to begin. And we actually don't, don't just put the penalty on the mothers, we put them on their children and we put in a generational inequity. And, and, this, and this disparity continues. And, this, and, this is, and, and when people think, well, it doesn't really affect me. And no, actually it does. And, 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 and it affects you because what happens you know, later on when, when your children marry their children? I mean, this is, this is something that you have to actually start thinking about. And, um, and what happens when those children grow up and go into the workforce and they are less healthy than the other children who are breastfed? I mean, these, these are big deals and this is where equity begins. And, and, it's, and, and, and it's because those mothers could not breastfeed. And, the, and, the, and, and this, is, this is a disparaging thing that, that we do to, to not just those women, but we do to those women's children and to the men who don't think that it, it affects them, it does affect you. And, and, it, and it's a big deal and, it, and, and, it, and it's a bigger deal than I don't think, I don't think society really actually gets how big a deal this, this is. And it, and it goes further than not having formula right now. It goes, it goes back to those children that were breastfed, they have a health advantage and we gave that health advantage to those mothers and to those families. And I think that you guys made some really great points that really transition into my next question about gender e equality and um, health equity. And so can you guys, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you explain more how does gender equality and supporting breastfeeding help create better health equity in the United States? Patricia, did you want to take that or John? Okay, and maybe we touched on it a little <laughs> bit. You know, it really sets these kids up um, just at the beginning of their life when everything's just starting. That they're they're you know they put their best foot forward health wise, and how that could have consequences on down the line. So, April, can I actually speak to something more about that though too? Because I, everything that Patricia was saying was so important, and I think because it's it's you know, and I talk about this somewhat. I am talking a lot from lawyers just because that's the group that I'm in, and and. I want to make clear, not all lawyers have these big incomes by any stretch. There are plenty of lawyers who do not have um, strong financial resources. That said, generally speaking, women in the legal profession do have more quote unquote choices. They do have some more access a lot of times, but the intersectionality of this issue is so critical. People working in um, factory jobs, people working in um, jobs where they have less access, um, and certainly women of color already facing a, a bias. This is another bias that gets layered on top of it, along with the motherhood bias. And so just the, as to Patricia's point, the, um, the implications, especially for women of color around the access to accommodations, um, the ability to ask for accommodations, I think is critical. There just aren't enough, and, and people from lower socioeconomic um, backgrounds to be able to get the accommodations that they need um, is really important. And so we talk about equality and equity. I just, this came up in a conference that I was speaking at the other day, and I think it's kind of important to know, you know, we think about everything being equal doesn't always work. Right. What's the equality around breastfeeding when men don't have to do it? I mean, it's not that it's not an important term, but we're talking about equity. How do we create a situation where this, the situation's not equal, it's not the same because that doesn't make any sense, but how do we create a situation where this lactating individual still has an equitable opportunity with a non-lactating individual um, in those circumstances. So I just think that sometimes the those words like it maybe helps to think about those words because it's not okay to just provide the same, like the bar exam, for example, if I can speak about that for a moment, it's like you have to provide an equitable opportunity for a lactating individual taking the bar exam to somebody who's not. And that's going to mean that you might need to um, have additional break time. That's going to need mean that you need to have um, what are called stop the clock test breaks so that because it needs to be fair to the other test takers too, right? So they, they can 
do a part of their exam, stop the clock, they cannot go back and access the prior exam, take an extra break to pump, have enough time to pump. This 15 minute break thing is ridiculous if you can't even get from the test room to the pump room and back, much less pump or wash your hands or go to the bathroom. Um, so I think, I think that's just kind of an interesting nuance, but something that's important to think about. I like that that's true because it isn't always just about making equal um, access or equal arrangements across the board whenever it's something that you can't be equal because it's just um, not something that everybody experiences. So, um, you know, John, as a member of the Oklahoma State or former member of the Oklahoma State House of Representatives, you authored House Bill 2102. And in 2004, the Oklahoma State Legislature passed legislation which states that mothers have the right to breastfeed anywhere they have the right to be and uh, shall be excused from jury duty upon request. So that was a super big win for Oklahoma. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how, I think you touched on it in your opening remarks somewhat, about how this bill originated and how you got your colleagues on board for passing such great legislation. Yeah, so thanks. So it, once again, um, uh, Becky will remember, uh, and, and so will probably several others on the call, but a Ann Roberts used to bring me a list of what the top 10 issues were affecting child advocacy issues. And and I'm a numbers guy. I've, I'm a finance guy. I'm, I'm a numbers guy. And so historically, I worked on budget-related issues. And so I would pick out the three or four budget-related issues that she had to see if I could try to help in, in some small way. Um, and down there, about number eight, nine, or 10 on the list was uh, a mother who had been harassed at a Burger King in Utah uh, for breastfeeding her child. At the time, uh, we had two small children and, and soon to be a third later. And I, I just remember the struggles uh, that my wife went through and just how much time and effort and what a blessing it was that, that uh, for the health benefits that she breastfed all of our children. And I thought, that seems like a no brainer. And so I told Ann, I said, well, I'll take the breastfeeding issue too. Uh, along with the the financial ones, and un, I mean, unbeknownst to me, it it uh, just seemed like uh, Michelle, like you said, that it's it's something very simple. But it really, I, the further I got into it, the more I realized it wasn't really that simple. And it was because of people not understanding the struggles that that mothers were up against. And so, um, you know, it was kind of easy to get everybody on board. I think most people knew that. I came from things from a very genuine standpoint, and I think sometimes mm -hmm. that goes a long way. And um, so anyway, so hence uh, House Bill 2102. Great. And do you have any um, tips that you can share with us as to how we as citizens can appeal to our legislators to normalize breastfeeding, give them that education and help prioritize programs for breastfeeding families? You, you know, I think for me, it was always providing me with talking points or educational points and then giving me the time to absorb that and digest it and and uh, basically uh, see what that meant you know I, so lobbying your lobbyist in my opinion is a very good good thing um, but just giving them the time to you know kind of step back and and read that in their own time and and uh, take it in as opposed to you know, maybe trying to read it on the fly and, and not really understanding it and, and not being able to make an educated decision. So April, if I may, if I may add something, we talk about, you know, um, the law was passed, you know, for um, asking for jury exemption. And so I want you to know, I got my jury summons to, for Oklahoma County and I, I circled this and I sent it to Becky and, and others and John Kerry that it says upon request, a person shall be exempt, a mother who is breastfeeding. So anyway, just know it's on there. So I was so excited. I think I might have even posted it, so. That's great. That's a really big, um, 
that's a really big problem that people face when they're they receive this summons that's so intimidating and then they've got these options i know michelle spoke about it i think patricia did also that you're having to make these huge choices that really shouldn't be a big choice you should be given the accommodations to take care of your family it shouldn't interact with those other obligations you might have elsewhere so that's great i'm glad that it's really working um, so Oklahoma's breastfeeding friendly worksite designation program recognizes companies for their outstanding support to nursing mothers. Um, I'd love to open it up to the panel to hear if you all have some creative approaches um, that companies might be able to use or, or things that you've heard of um, uh, as to how they can support their breastfeeding employees. We'll start with Michelle. I'll just go down the line. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I think those designations can be really helpful, particularly when we look around right now at how difficult um, workforces are, or workplaces are, are um, the difficulties they're facing to get employees in. So any tool we can give them to let them um, brag on themselves and market themselves as a work, you know, a friendly workplace, I think is really great. I do think that thankfully we've got younger people coming up behind us who are demanding, not asking, but demanding that their workplaces be more friendly friendly, and I really appreciate their strength and their voices um, on that. And so I think those kinds of designations can be really helpful. And sometimes, like it, you know, going back to the, some of this, I think, is purposeful res resistance. So I don't think that just education is going to do it by itself. But for people who just don't realize and they they need the help like giving them a, a a map to follow like here's the if you want to be a designation here's 10 things to do to make yourself get this designation that can really give them a a, a road map to follow and sometimes that's what they want and that that can be really helpful so i think that that's um i think those kinds of things can be really useful because i think employers appreciate them from multiple different perspectives that's great. That really goes in line with kind of the educating and like, let's just make it foolproof. What is the easiest way for them to understand what these accommodations look like? I like that, Michelle. Yeah. Patricia, do you have any creative ideas um, to help employers accommodate their breastfeeding employees? I'm sorry, was that was that to me? Yes, please. Okay, I, 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 I cut out there for well, or I cut out. Um, so, uh, you know, with, with EEOC, it's always about the law. Um, and uh, and so you know when it comes down, down down to the law, that's 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 pretty cut and dry. Most HR people know know what the law says. You have to follow it. Uh, but uh, one of the things things that EEOC always makes makes clear is uh, your policies have to be in order. And uh, and so you have to you have to make sure that you follow uh, what, what 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 your written policies are, uh, because if if you don't, uh, we're we're going to question that. So make sure that. That everybody is on the same page with your policies, because you can have a clearly written policy, but if nobody follows it, um, we're we're going to question it. So you can have the greatest policies in the world and and not follow it, and that's 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 going to get you in trouble every single time. So, for example, and um, I'll use this as 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 an example because this actually recently happened. Um, you can have a, a nursing room. And everybody uses that, uh, you know, to, to, to store their, their snacks in the refrigerator and, um, and people go in there and nap because it's so nice and cozy. I was like, no, <laughs> that's not a break room. That's a nursing room. That refrigerator isn't for your snacks. Uh, so it has to be very clear what, 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 these, what the nursing room is and what the break room is. And you have to have, be very clear on the delineation of these things. Uh, so, Patricia, could I could I say something about what you're saying? Because we, yeah, yeah, because I I know, right? Go ahead. <laughs> we had a, I've been working really hard, and uh, and again, I want to I want to mention the ABA resolution that we got done because we're talking about laws. Um, you know, laws are one really great avenue. Education's an avenue, but also don't forget about things like. Um, um, like giving model policies or in the ABA case, the American Bar Association, that's the most, that's the biggest national representative um, 
uh, Bar Association for the Legal Profession, we advocated for a resolution to get passed, um, outlining the policy that we wanted them to adopt. So there's a lot of different angles to take, um, but we asked not only for bar exams, but also the bar associations in each individual state, which comes back to what I wanted to mention in, in line with your example, Patricia, is that there's one particular state where I've really gotten them on board very early on to promise that they would always provide a breastfeeding space. Well, there's a lot of backstory to this that I don't need to get into, but sometimes I think people also get a little frustrated about you being sort of the squeaky wheel. And so we went, I was at a conference and I was actually speaking at the conference in this state for this bar exam. And people from the Mother's Esquire group in the same state were texting me and messaging me, Michelle, here's what the breastfeeding room looks like. It was literally an empty room with no tables, no chairs, no nothing. We had like a coat rack sitting in there and um, there was no signage for it either. And so it's like, they had a policy, but it, it didn't do anything because what they did, what they provided was ineffective. Um, and so of course, then I had to go and deal with that. It, and I'm speaking at the conference. So I was really like, so, so frustrated, but it policies help, but they also have to like follow through on what they say they're going to do. Well, you know, what's worse because you know, the, the other one is the one where they have the nice, you know, the nice nursing room and everybody complains that nobody uses it. And so why do we have this? This is such a waste. And it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, it, it just, it, it just, oh my gosh, there, there's just no words. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, words. That's that's good points. Um, make sure you follow through with what your policies say and don't just give lip service to some accommodations, but actually go through it and and make sure that that's a designated space, not the break room, not a closet, not a coat room, whatever. So it's not um, where people take their naps. Right, <laughs> right. Um, John, do you have any suggestions on creative approaches that companies can take to support these breastfeeding families? Yeah, so I don't necessarily have anything necessarily to add that that uh, the other two panelists haven't already said. I would just say creative to me also means educational. And it's it's just, you know, trying to find those people like myself who understood the struggles that my wife was up against, which made me an advocate, um, an easy advocate uh, for that. And so I think it's just, you know, not isolating, but, you know, finding those people that, that have that same passion that, that you do and the understanding, um, you know, so to, Michelle, to your point, so, you know, it's not a squeaky wheel or someone complaining about this or that. It's, it's finding someone that is uh, passionate about the issue. And that to me seems to get more done uh, than anything else. I think you're right on that. Um, so, you know, we've mentioned, or um, I think someone mentioned earlier that more than half the states um, in the United States now have some um, law specifically addressing lactation accommodations in the workplace. And Patricia, I think that you're our expert maybe on this uh, topic. So can you briefly describe what the law says about breastfeeding at work and what accommodations the employers are required to um, provide? Well, I'm on a federal level, so um, so on the and 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 here's you know the the the, the big reveal um, EEOC uh, we you know we actually defer to the part Department of Labor uh, so so it's the Department of Labor which actually has uh, the breastfeeding uh, laws we 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 come under accommodation um, issues which are, are covered under Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act under pregnancy discrimination. Uh, and so, and so that's that. That's where EEOC comes under uh, sex sex discrimination. Uh, and so, um, on those, there there are going to be very various instances in which discrimination is going to go against an employee who's um, who's who's being discriminated against uh, uh, on, on that for, for for lactation. So, so that's going to go with post uh, part in, uh, um, uh, production of milk, which is uh, a physiological process triggered by hormones. So that's that's actually how EEOC gets in it because lactation is a pregnancy related medical condition which is um, which is done done through Title seven. So that's 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 how we 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 come into it. Um, do you want me to give you an example? Okay. So so for for an example, um, 
uh, a manager's statement that an employee was demoted because of breast, breast breastfeeding schedule may raise an inference that uh, the demotion was unlawful based on a pregnancy related medical condition of lactation. So, so that's, that's something that, that, that we, would, we would look at under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So, so that's where somebody could come into filing a charge of discrimination under that. Um, so, so that's 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 where where we where we would come into it um, under caregiving under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So there are a lot of ways that EEOC would would protect uh, someone uh, under uh, under breastfeeding under lactation laws. So so like the breastfeeding, the nursing uh, mothers are very very specific laws under that to protect them. But if somebody's being discriminated against because of that. That, that those are issues that we could come under, and I can I can address those you know specifically as as we as we talk. But but that's kind of like the bigger picture, so that you know I don't overwhelm people with information. Okay, that's great. Do you know? Um, do you have anything to offer about what options employees have if an employer doesn't make those necessary accommodations? Yeah, yeah. So 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 if an employer is failing to to make accommodations. Um, to, to, to accommodate an employee who is who is um, breastfeeding, uh, we can you, you, they, they can file a charge under um, sex sex discrimination, um, and they can they can they they can use their you know the um, the designation that they are they are breastfeeding and that they do they have asked for an accommodation under that, and so um, and so for that they they can file under Title VII uh, sex um, you know breast breastfeeding, and so. Um, so, so that's 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 already been done. I mean, we 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 can do that. There's 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 no no lift with that. Okay. Um, the Pump for Nursing Mothers Act would strengthen the break time for nursing mothers law by expanding workplace protections for lactating workers, um, clarifying employers' obligations under the law, and ensuring breastfeeding mothers have access to appropriate remedies. If the Pump Act does not get to the president's desk this session, um, what hope is there for the millions of lactating employees who work in occupations without accommodations? And I'll open that up to the panel. I'm not sure which one of you want to address that. I can mention, Patricia, did you have something? You can go ahead. You're um, more familiar. Well, um, you know, as far as um, uh, women who women who who, who lack, lack, lactate, um, they can they they have um, they could they they can file charges of discrimination if um, if 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 they need um, to 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 pump and and their company is is not allowing them to take breaks for 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 for, for breast pumping. So 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 the Pump Act. You know, would would not would not um, minimize their ability to file a charge of discrimination on this. Just, I just want to put put that out there. Um, I also just, I actually had not read about the Pump Act until we began talking about this, but I was a little dismayed. I, I, I think some of the language. I, I don't want to say like we shouldn't get something through, but the language about um, a reasonable break time. Um, is required and a place is required, but then they specifically exempt that they shall not be required to compensate an employee receiving reasonable break time. And I feel like that just undermines the whole point because for women of lower socioeconomic or more um, uh, the, the kind of jobs that we were talking about earlier that are more um, just less likely to give them, I just feel like that just creates this out for, for them. And I, I don't, I don't mean to to, um, to diminish any efforts that are being made, but it just concerns me a little bit. I'm sorry, Becky, did you have a question? Yeah, um, this actually was a question for me and Sandy, who I know um, has to leave here in a little bit. Um, but um, since it's if it's a pregnancy, if we define lactation as a pregnancy-related medical condition, are there any protections then for someone who induces lactation, say who's adopting a baby and has actually stimulated lactation without actually having a pregnancy? Uh, so we actually have a fair amount of that. Um, they would still be protected. But they never had a pregnancy. So that's the question, so. Yeah, yeah they would, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they would, they would still be, be, be protected. Um, 
Well, somebody was pregnant. <laughs> somebody was pregnant and now somebody's lactating. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't would, mean to live, I, but it I, seems like it's still related to being pregnant. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would have, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I would have to go back and check, but um, I would, um, I, 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 I would, I would. I would have to look under our caregiver guidance, but I would I would assume under our caregiver guidances there would there would probably be something if not under EEOC under the family under Family Medical Leave Act um, or under um, a Department of Labor laws there would there would still be protection under that. That is an interesting point. I had never thought of um, lactation needs as a pregnancy related medical condition. So that's an interesting definition. But then the, um, you know, the non pregnancy related lactation through adoption and things that raises a really interesting question. And I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier, that it's not an equality issue, it's an equity issue. And so how do we support all lactating individuals, regardless of how they arrived at this decision, whether or not to lactate. So that's a very interesting point. Um, if, if we look at it as a public health issue. Um, that's what you have to add in there too. We still have a baby that needs to be fed. Right. Right. Yeah. I I I know that 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 when 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 Title Seven when when we when we when we did the um the the walk down um uh, you know down down the road that was that was how we we came to it uh to, to protect women under Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act. Um, but you know you know, medical science changes and, um, and, and laws change with, with, with medical science. But um, that was, that was, that was how women lactation and breastfeeding came under that, um, under, under Title VII. However, we do have caregiving guidance with EEOC. Uh, and so uh, it would depend on, um, on the circumstances, but it still could fall under care, un, under our caregiving. But we also know the Department of Labor has um, has laws that protect um, people under Family Medical Leave Act, and uh, they and they do have um, very very specific laws under breastfeeding. Um, so so those they, they may protect be protected under those those very specific laws. It's definitely I think this one thing that I've uh, heard from John and Michelle and you Patricia was that it seems like it's very common sense and straightforward. But then when you get into the individual issues, it's really nuanced and how do we address those nuances. So um, one problem I think that we have um, we're all aware of right now is this formula shortage. And um, as a result, it's prompting calls to increase support for breastfeeding and more working mothers are reconsidering um, whether or not to breastfeed as an option. So how do you all think that they can get the support that you need from their employers? Well, for me, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I, you know, and my role is EEOC, I can't advocate for anything, um, but uh, for, for employers, uh, we 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 ask employers don't discriminate against anything, um, and so there is there is there is never um, it, it it never works against um, employers when when they build their build their employment um, you know uh, workforce to be more inclusive, uh, and so the the more the more inclusive they can be, the more opportunities they they raise for everybody. Um, so. <clears throat> the, the the advantage to to building a more fam friendly workplace for people um, who can breastfeed, uh, th th there's no downside to it, right? I mean, the you know the the the, the advantage to it is that is that you're going to increase uh, a, a work a workplace that is that is going to bring in people into the workplace who are going to stay after they're they're, they're done breastfeeding, and not only does it help society, it also helps. Um, to raise raise the morale of the workplace. I mean, so so it's not not a bad thing, um, and it also it, it also helps employers um, figure out ways to 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 do things in the workplace. I, I know I know this is going to sound um, kind of I, I don't know uh, Pollyanna, but but every time uh, employers you know we we brought in a, a a new group into the not and I don't say that you know breastfeeding is a new group but every time we 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 we've asked employers to try to do things differently it's always worked out very well for employers and I'm going to use like the Americans with Disabilities Act 
uh, for example. You know, when we first asked the employers to, to consider modifying the workplace to, to make it more friendly to people with disabilities, there was a lot of pushback. But now the workplace is so accommodating that we just went through a global pandemic and, and a lot of employers easily transitioned uh, to, to, to you know, a, a mobile workplace and a telecommuting workplace with very little uh, problems. And that was actually because that whole groundwork had been laid uh, because of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And, and most people don't realize that. And, and so, so there are things, groundwork that gets laid when you, when you open up an inclusive workplace that, that you don't even think about. And so th th there's never really a bad time to be inclusive. That's true. I think it um, helps to build a great culture and it helps to really, you know, I always say a, a rising tide floats all boats, right? If we can help right. black eating mothers, then we're really helping, you know, the, it, the trickle effect amongst um, everybody else and not just lactating mothers, but everything. If you can accommodate those folks that work for you, then you're going to get a better work out of them and people are going to work harder and, and you're going to retain those good employees. So, yeah. um, John, do you have any insight as to how employees can maybe advocate for themselves uh, to get the support that they need in from their employer? Yeah, so as far as being advocating for yourself, sometimes that's that's tough. You, you know, young women are often apprehensive to speak up um, about things. And so I think it's finding that support system. Other, you know, you take a, an older gentleman now um, who understands the struggles that uh, you would be going through and you maybe build a coalition group to, to approach uh, that employer as to why that's beneficial to take these avenues and these steps. I think you're right. Usually if you can get more than one person on board, employers generally will listen to you, especially if you have someone on board who isn't going to directly benefit from the program. If you've got um, someone who will never lactate again, whether they're past that point in life or you know they're male or they just genetically cannot do that, then it's great to have um, a support system for people who don't benefit from whatever request you're making. So Michelle, do you have anything to add about how um, people can advocate for themselves with their employer? Well, I definitely agree with John that, you know, having someone to advocate um, with you, for you, you know, by your side can be helpful. That's why I've somehow or another become this person that people come to across the country when they are being denied accommodations at the bar exam. I have to step back and say too, I love all of you all here today. I hated breastfeeding. I did not like it at all. I did it for a year each. I called it baby prison. I don't know how I became a person who now advocates for people who breastfeed, but I think it's, um, I think, um, I just, I think there's so much, there's a point here that I'm trying to make. And that is there's so much in any time we face a problem, there's so much of shifting of blame to individuals and because because if we focus on an individual and if we say well there's a formula shortage you should just be breastfeeding why aren't you breastfeeding or if you're breastfeeding they say why, why don't you just give that baby formula then you don't need breaks at work uh, right so there's so much focus and as long as we keep focusing on individuals and individuals choices then we don't ever have to look at the systemic issues that are actually causing the problem so i think like this whole thing about how, because I felt like there was a lot of sense of blame coming around with the formula shortage to say like, well, it's your fault to begin with because you should just breastfeed because breastfeeding is free. We all know breastfeeding is free, right? Like, you know, I'm being very sarcastic and um, I try to say this over and over again. I know everybody in this audience already knows this, but breastfeeding is only free if a woman's time and labor has no value. And a woman's time and labor has a lot of value. So it is not free. You just don't have to pay for it directly yourself. Um, I had to pay for it. We had to pay for it, right, in our time. Um, but that said, like, I, I'm really sensitive to people needing to make the, the choice that works for them, especially when the system is pushing them into 
not having a choice. So I, I, I really, I want to always just, and I know you all do too, I want to always remove any blame or any judgment around whatever choice that somebody makes that's going to work for them because you have to feed your family, including bringing enough income to feed your family. So if formula ends up being the way that somebody goes, I would never, ever want somebody to feel judged or, um, or, or feel like they did something wrong or anything like that. So I think like always, every time somebody wants to blame that individual or talk about that individual's choice, I always want to come back to let's step back and what is the systemic issue that is causing this problem so I don't know if I got a little far afield from your your question but I I, I do think um, having somebody to advocate with an individual woman but then also making sure that advocate has their eye on the the prize over here like what is the systemic issue that is leading to this challenge and how can we get to that like I, like one of the frustrations with the ADA issue the bar exam issue is that we keep somehow managing to get accommodations for an individual by, you know, by the skin of our teeth and it's just scraping towards getting somebody to have reasonable accommodation. But I just cannot get these policies changed. The policy has to change. The procedure has to change. Um, and so even though I'm advocating for individual women over and over again, I feel like I'm not getting it done because I'm not getting the policy changes and I'm not going to quit until the policy changes. Um, so that's, that was a long answer that maybe wasn't exactly responsive, but I do think it's important that we, uh, that we make sure to focus on those systems. No, I think I too hated uh, breastfeeding. It is a chore. You have to bring a bunch of stuff with you. Um, and, you know, I had to, Heidi mentioned it at the beginning. I wrote an article with Above the Law. I had two really different experiences. Uh, the first, after my first child, I had an employer who was not accommodating at all. He walked in on me one time uh, while I was pumping, like just really uncomfortable stuff. Um, and as a result, I only rest or I only nursed for, you know, a couple of months because it was easier for me to then just give it up. Uh, fast forward to my second daughter, I had a, an employer who was very accommodating, would, you know, go the extra mile with whatever I needed. And as a result, we did it for a year and it, you know, we counted down the days until that year because I hated it. But it's just such a big difference and it was so empowering that it was able to be my choice and that I had people on board who were willing to just um, meet me where I was and perhaps my accommodation or what I needed was different than the person that came before me, but they were willing to listen and figure out a way to solve that problem. So I love that. And I'm sorry, I think I cut you off, Patricia. I think you had something else to add. No. Oh, no, no. no. I was just like, oh. <laughs> your employer walking in on you just oh <laughs> well I mean I think if we told her the stories though April because I was pumping when I was a summer clerk and a male associate would not stop knocking on my door repeatedly and it's like you could hear the part and he was a parent and the this was the really fun thing is that I finished and then I let him in and then he comes and he sits down and he was like you know my wife decided to be a stay-at-home mom because our children are her priority. Um, and so that was his response to finding out that I was pumping at work. And um, those cuts hurt and they there's a lot of them. And so like to your experience, what I found just anecdotally, but with, but, and then lawyers is that they go into the first one, they, they got their plan. I'm going to breastfeed and I'm going to breastfeed for this long and I'm going to make it work. And they get to work and people won't stop knocking on their door, won't stop emailing them, scheduling depositions over top of their pump times, won't give them a space. You know, they face all these challenges and they end up making a decision. Like I just can't, I've got to work. I cannot continue on under these circumstances. So they decide to stop breastfeeding. And then I, I don't want to speak for you, April, but I know a lot of people feel really frustrated frustrated that they didn't get to do it the way they wanted to do it. And they're really angry about that. So then they have baby number two comes along and they're like, I come hell or high water. I am going to breastfeed this baby the way I plan to. And so they have all these systems in place and either they work and they feel really successful or they run right into the exact same obstacles again. And they're still mad from the first time. And so then I've seen women quit their jobs and change jobs multiple times because that baby number two was the kicker. They're like, I'm not doing it again. And I'm not putting up with this again. And I'm not going to feel guilty, you know, for, for two years afterwards, because I got forced into this corner. And so I've seen that happen. I'm so glad that you had the second experience that you had, because I think that probably made a big difference for you. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's really interesting to me how much you don't think about how your employer impacts your um, like that first year after you've had a baby, um, your postpartum experience, but they really do. And so it's, I love that we're having this conversation and talking about the ways that employers should be making accommodations and maybe what accommodations there should be um, coming down the pike. So um, we are running, we're running short on a little bit of time, but we've got a few more minutes. I wanted to open it up to each of the panelists just to provide a, you know, a closing remarks, anything that we hadn't uh, had an opportunity to touch on, just if there's anything else in a couple of minutes that you want to add. And I'll start with Patricia. Well, as always, if you believe that, well, not believe, if you question that you may be having your rights violated. For example, um, I, I love the fact that you brought up that, that you have, while you're pumping, you have a coworker pounding on your door and people passively aggressively trying to find out um, about whether or not you're pumping or making you know snide little remarks about your you know whether or not you should be a stay-at-home mother. I mean these are things you know that 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 cut and make you wonder whether or not you're welcome in the workplace and whether or not your rights are being violated. You know don't wait to find out whether or not your rights are in fact being violated. Contact my agency um, at 800-669-4000 and that's 800-669-4000. That is our our, our 800 number, you can call that number and talk to somebody uh, about uh, whether or not your, your rights are being violated. We, we, we ask people, please, um, it is better, better to ask um, whether or not your rights are being violated than to find out later that your rights were violated and, uh, and your time has ran out. Uh, you can also go to the EEOC website at eeoc.gov and go to our online portal. And there's actually um, a series of questions that you ask. And we ask people, ask them, answer them honestly, because if, um, if, if you're not at the right agency, the portal will direct you to where you're supposed to go uh, so that you can get, get to the right agency. Uh, again, we don't, we don't handle a lot of the, the actual breastfeeding, but it does go to the Department of Labor and we'll get to the right agency. But we, we wanna make sure your rights are protected. That's, that's the main, um, uh, responsibility of regulatory agencies. So thank you. That's great. Thank you for those um, resources, Patricia, because I think a lot of people maybe, I mean, I am a lawyer and I am, a, I can Google like anybody else and I, I didn't know or I questioned whether or not some things are being infringed upon. So it's great. I think that goes back to the education as well, even educating, not just people in positions to make the accommodations, but also advocating and educating women um, or lactating individuals as to what their rights might be. So thank you for that, Patricia. John, do you have any closing remarks to add to the group? Yeah, I, just very briefly, I would just say, you know, we are all very fortunate, uh, had an opportunity to be well-educated. And so, you know, it's, it would be easy for me to say, House Bill 2102, I'm done. My part's done. Thank you very much. Do a victory lap, pat me on the back. Um, but it's not done. I think what we have brought forward today is that there's always an opportunity to advocate for someone else. You know, uh, I work at a bank. We're very fortunate that, that we make money and we have a very nice uh, breastfeeding room. Can you imagine uh, Michelle, Patricia, you both kind of alluded to it. Can you imagine what other people are up against um, and the accommodations that, that they have? And so I've always been someone that wanted smart people around me. I think it makes me smarter. And so why would we diminish that in any stretch of the imagination? And so I would just say that as humbling as this has been and as exciting as it's been for someone to remember an old guy that had a piece of legislation years ago um, that the, that there's still much work to be done. 
That's great, John. And I appreciate that, you know, you did, you did accomplish something great for Oklahoma, but that's not where it stops and that you're continuing to do that. It sounds like in your workplace um, to make sure those accommodations are met and, and advocating how you can and where you can, because we can't all be everywhere at, at all the times, but we can definitely influence those people around us. So I appreciate that. Um, and Michelle, any closing remarks from you? Well, thank you. Um, I really appreciated what um, Patricia was saying as far as being able to reach out. And I am an attorney and I don't work in um, um, in individual matters. I'm a business lawyer. Um, but that said, I think that it's also good to know that you don't have to. I think the idea of hiring a lawyer and going through that process can be both intimidating and also you worried about the expense of being able to afford a lawyer. I like that people can reach out directly to call. Um, you don't have to necessarily, maybe you might choose that a lawyer would be helpful to you, but that doesn't mean that you need one. You can get this resource. You don't have to hire a lawyer to get help on this issue. Um, so I think that's helpful. Um, and then also um, um, I was going to, mentioned something else and just went right out of it. Oh, I, I, I know. Um, we talked about the caregiver discrimination guidelines from the EOC. This is a tang tangential point or a side point to this, but the fact that they don't discriminate against, they, they say you cannot discriminate on child giver, child caregiver um, accommodations. That's really related to this in my mind because the way that we have traditionally treated people, so somebody gets pregnant or adopts a baby, we tend to say like mom can take some time off if, if they get that, um, but we don't focus on dads, but then that causes us to continue to repeat this pattern where mom is the caregiver, dad is the worker, and dad is kind of dismissed um, both excused from and also dismissed as the parent um, and mom is meant to take on the full responsibility and we set that pattern in motion and that then that impacts lactation and all of that so I think um, as along with lactation I think we also need to think about making sure that there is paid leave and that it is equal um, for both parents so that we are not causing moms to continue in this role of always being the primary caregiver. And the very last thing I'll say is kind of related to what April and John was saying, when I speak about these kind of big issues sometimes, I'll often say, imagine that there's a puzzle in front of you, right? And there's this picture that you can imagine. You are, you are one piece. And you should be the best piece you can be. You don't have to be the whole picture. You don't have to be the whole picture by yourself. So when this feels overwhelming, like John was alluding to, like what is the piece that you can be in this big picture? What's the thing you can do? Is there one thing that you could do that would help this issue? Focus on that so you don't get overwhelmed, um, but you can still contribute. Because I, I do think sometimes these things can feel like overwhelming. So just to remind yourself that there is a part you can play and you know what that is and, you know, work on that piece and feel really good about that piece because look at what John's work did and what it led to on the form that Heidi showed. So, um, you know, be, be the best piece you can be. That's so good. Thank you guys for all the panelists for your time today. I think I learned a lot and I um, I really appreciate your time and your effort, not just in educating us, but the work that you're doing to advance these issues. So thank you to all of our panelists and I will turn it back over to Becky. All right, thank you, April. And yes, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, great information. And um, I think as um, Michelle made the point, actually everyone made the point about systems and policies and it shouldn't always depend on one individual. And a shout out to Senator Hicks. Um, uh, she can certainly share from her um, years as a, a public school teacher. Now she's you know, in the state Senate, but she was at three children, three breastfeeding experiences, three different schools three different principals and her support or lack thereof always depended on the principal at that given school. So she stepped up and helped get um, Senate Bill 121 passed. So that will hopefully no longer happen. Uh, so when we can look at it from the systems and policy uh, standpoint, we can really impact um, a lot of people. So reach out to um, your state coalition um, as well as all the resources um, you know, uh, that everyone has shared and the information from the EEOC so that um, you're not in this alone or the, the families that many of you on the webinar today are um, working with so that you can give resources to the families as well. So um, I guess, yeah, stay safe um, out there everyone and um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank me.
Thanks so much.